Let's do this. Okay, so we have this, the first string quartet by Elliot Carter. Now these string quartets, his string quartets, are kind of famous for using a technique called uh, metric modulation. Now that's one big aspect of this piece. It's not the one that we're focusing on today, but you'll notice that, and again, I, uh, I would like you to have listened to at least the first few minutes of this piece to get an idea of what it sounds like. But you'll notice that um, we have, first of all, each of the four instruments has a different type of rhythmic logic. So the cello starts off, it's a big cello solo, and then it's, uh, you know, has lots of different rhythms. But uh, when the second violins enter, second violin en enters, it's in um, the pulse is essentially dotted eighth notes against uh, kind of the quarter notes in the cello. And then the cello goes into quintuplet sixteenth notes. And this little thing here, quarter note equals five, essentially five sixteenth notes. What that means is that this quintuplet sixteenth note becomes the new normal sixteenth note. And so he eases us into this uh, slightly faster tempo, I guess by a, a fifth faster. Um, and um, so that's kind of interesting. And then again, we have um, at this point, the dotted quarter, I mean, the dotted eighth kind of takes over. And then the this little thing here indicates that the dotted eighth is the new quarter note. Okay, so basically we have a situation where you're going like this. Here's our quarter note. That's the quintuplet sixteenth note. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Becomes the new normal sixteenth note. That's our quarter note. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then he subdivides in three. That's the dotted eight. And then dun bum 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 ticka 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 ticka. That becomes the new quarter note. So that's essentially the process that we go through from here to here to here to here. Okay. And he got more sophisticated and more ambitious with this technique with later string quartets and other pieces. To my mind, uh, I've done a lot of, I've used metric modulations a fair amount. Um, I find that if they're too obscure, they're not super interesting because you can't really hear what's happening. But in this case, um, this one I think is is audible, but some of his later more complex ones, you can't really hear that, that effect of the metri metric modulation, the kind of shifting gears, which is a you know a really pleasurable, fun sensation. If it's too complex, you don't really hear it. But anyway, that's not necessarily what we're talking about today. today. Um, today we're looking at um, our uh, pitch class sets in this. And you have this um, <clears throat> piece in your Hicks packet, but I wanted to look specifically at the, um, the pitch class sets. There's a lot going on here, but the main thing we want to look at is the way Elliot Carter uses the all interval tetrachord, which when we say the all interval tetrachord, it pretty much always means the 4Z15, which Dr. Hicks has analyzed this piece and shown us all these instances of the 4Z15. The 4Z15, if you recall, is 0, 1, 4, 6, 0, 1, 4, 6, 
which inverts to 0, 1, 4, 6. And we remember that uh, this particular set class gives us lots of very familiar chords, for instance, the um, the 13th chord, dominant 13th, and the, or the, uh, you know, I always call it the foxy lady chord. That is the 4Z15. Um, and then, uh, we also have this chord here. So there's lots of 4Z15s. Now the thing to keep in mind is that what we're talking about right now is we've looked at music by Webern and Schoenberg. We could also look at music by Stravinsky and Bartok, Charles Ives, and lots of others who wrote free atonal music. In other words, atonal music that doesn't use the 12-tone method. And uh, these composers had various ways of composing, but they all tended to uh, start with intervals as building blocks or, or combinations of intervals. So that when this, you know, this was all music composed in the first half of the 20th century, when um, pitch class set theory came around in the 1950s, uh, these pieces, uh, seem to be easily analyzable using pitch class set theory. Then, after Alan Fort's book came out and you know he was circulating among famous or at least influential composers like Elliot Carter, um, these composers, and especially we'll focus on Elliot Carter and George Crumb, started to use this theory to compose. They said, well, this is, this is actually a pretty cool theory to compose music. Why don't we just consciously start with um, pitch class sets, or set classes at least, and use those to compose? And so this is what we find in Elliot Carter's and George Crumb's music. Elliot Carter particularly liked this all interval tetrachord that gave him these very rich chords. Let's blow this up a little bit here. Um, okay, so we have this this shape here. Of course, this is overlapping with a lot of other stuff. Uh, I believe we've got the F and the B flat. There it is. E, F, A flat, B flat. And, um, but... And we have this one down here. So that's, you know, we've got, uh, let's see, B, D, E. And then let's move that A sharp down an octave. And there we've got another one. Again, these are set classes. Um, and then look at this. We've got a 4Z29, which is, I'm going to move this up an octave. cool sound to it. Let's collapse it in on itself and 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 um, remember the 4Z29 is a 0, 1, 3, 7. 0, 1, 3, 7 is the 4Z29. You can look that up on your chart in the Hicks packet, but again, we're looking at this one. We'll collapse it in on itself. Move that D down an octave. Move that B down an octave. Okay, now we're going to have to shuffle this around here a little bit to make it into normal order. Let's uh, move the B down another octave down here. And then we've got the... Uh, okay, actually let's move this um, G down. Okay, so this is a good order here. Let's look at this again. I've got G, B, C sharp, D. Okay, now that's the upside down, the inverted version of the 0, 1, 3, 7. We'll count it from the top. 0, 1, 3, 7. 
Well, that's kind of cool because it's a major triad plus a sharp four or a sharp 11. That's the one version. And then the minor triad with a sharp with a flat two is the other version. Okay, so these are the two all interval tetrachords. They are Z related. And if you recall, we said the Z relationship, which is the only what we would call similarity relationship between two uh, set classes that we're going to talk about. There are other ones that we don't talk about that Dr. Hicks actually has analyzed here. That's what this R2 and RP are, but we don't talk about those in this class. Maybe if you were to take a more advanced pitch class set theory uh, class, you might talk about those. And again, another four, uh, where are we? 4Z15 here. Um, Again, if we were to crunch this down, we would move this E up. And this is the upside down of the 0, 1, 4, 6, 0, 1, 4, 6. And here's another 4Z15. Um, so lots of these. Uh, there are other things we could talk about. Um, and uh, but we're not going to talk about that. The main point here is, again, the use of the all interval tetrachord, which Elliot Carter particularly liked, especially this 4Z15, but also the 4Z29. These two are Z related, meaning they share the same interval class vector, one 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 one. And they are both all interval tetrachords, but when we say the all interval tetrachord, we're referring to the 4Z15, which was used a lot more than the 4Z29 by composers who, who like to compose with pitch class sets. Okay, so again, uh, I assume you've listened to this movement. If you haven't, please listen to it. And you might wanna to listen to it again with this in mind, really interesting, crazy uh, cello solo. Um, anyway, we'll talk to you soon. Let's talk a little bit about George Crumb's music. Uh, specifically, this is Movement 3 from his third book of Madrigals, which are pieces for uh, voice and instruments. Um, but Crumb is another composer, like Elliot Carter, who uh, was familiar with Alan Fort's uh, theory of atonal music and actually used this theory to compose music. And again, this is kind of an interesting moment in music history where we have, you know, uh, theory preceding practice. Usually theory follows practice, but here's an instance in which theory precedes practice. Okay. And I have this um, score page, which is uh, in your uh, Hicks packet, I believe. But let's Let's have a look at it. And, you know, we have these um, these collections of pitches that are circled that kind of uh, guide us as to what to talk about. Um, now, I will show you something. Now, before we do this, let's listen to a little bit of it. Uh, okay, so let's listen to, from the beginning, 
uh, lullaby child, lullaby of the proud horse who would not drink water. Okay, let's turn up the volume and listen to a little bit of it while we follow along with the score. Harp followed by vibraphone, similar timbres, interesting. And now they've overlapped. Very interesting. We have the text here, then we have the pitches without the text, then we have the pitches and the text. Extended techniques, which Crumb loved. Okay, so clearly, so I apologize, but this is a different passage. This is the end of this movement. But let's go back. Um, and uh, look at this a little bit closer. Um, let's see if this works. Do I have the cursor? Yes, I do. Okay, so uh, of course there's lots we could talk about about this piece, but we're just gonna focus on uh, pitch class sets. Now, if I were to go, let me show you uh, this page here, which is Dr. Hicks's analysis. I don't know if I'm allowed to show you this, but you can see he's taken these um, boxes and analyzed them. And you can see this first one is a 6Z41. Um, and then uh, you can see it's 136789. Um, well, and then here's a 35389. So this is a type of more advanced analysis that we are not doing in this class um, that you might do in a more, you know, graduate level class or upper division class in music theory, where we actually talk about pitch class sets instead of set classes. And, you know, by using these numbers, um, you know, it, it enables us to analyze and discuss uh, not just the set class of a of a collection of pitches, but the actual sort of uh, placement of it in in pitch space and pitch class space. We're not going to do that, but this is just to give you an idea. The other thing you'll notice is that this has a diversity of different uh, types of set classes, different cardinalities. Cardinality meaning the number of elements in a set, the number of pitch classes in a pitch class set. Uh, hexachords, pentachords, trichords, and tetrachords. Uh, as I mentioned, I pretty much focus on trichords and tetrachords. Those are the ones that I personally can hear and trace during a piece. So I don't, uh, at least again, especially in Music 296, I don't tend to use these larger set classes, hexachords and pentachords. So let's go back to my... <laughs> very simplistic interpretation of this piece. And the main thing I want to point out is that we have the, we have this shape here. Very important chord. We've talked about this before. We sometimes call it the Viennese uh, triad or the Viennese trichord. 
usually uh, augmented fourth on the bottom, perfect fourth on the top, or in other words, tritone, and then perfect fourth. Sometimes upside down version of that, perfect fourth, then tritone. This is a much more familiar sound. So many jazz voicings use this. And I've mentioned this before. The, if we take this A, B sharp, G sharp, and we add an F on the bottom, we get a sharp nine chord. And if we add a B on the bottom, then we have our 13th chord dominant 13th chord. But anyway, of course, uh, Crum loved the kind of mysterious sound of this, and then it goes down a whole step. This is kind of the, the main sort of motive of this passage. Uh, and then you'll notice that the voice goes like this. transposition of that obviously without the the B you know it's hard to sing a perfect fourth with the voice easy to do it with a harp or a vibraphone this one has an incomplete version of that and then you can see it as an echo of course we know that echoes often uh, leave out some of the notes that were in the original sound. Um, and then it's, uh, you know, it's kind of an additive process in the vibraphone. We have this, and then, well, it's not really additive, is it? Then we finally get the complete thing. Um, and we keep repeating this. But, um, Again, it's all about the zero one six, which okay, if we take this and we turn it into normal order, let's take the we've got an A, a D sharp, and a G sharp. Let's put the A up an octave. And then we count it up and it's zero five six, or we count it from the top zero one six. That's the prime form. And of course, um, if we look at our well, let's do this. If we look at our um, Hicks packet, uh, sorry, this is taking a minute here. Um, we've got, you get to see the insides of my, of my, uh, here we go, my computer. Let's do this. Let's have a look. Okay, we want to find the 016. Where is the 016? It's the 35016. Okay, let's go back to this guy here. And um, uh, lots of 016 is 016 all over the place. And then it transposes here. Here we've got. And then this one here. This one here, and then this one here. Okay, so we've got lots of this this passage moving around, um, and then let's go to the this passage, which is at the end of the movement. Again, we've got. Um, let's see, what did I have here? This was a. Um, very difficult to sing, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, okay, so this is A, B flat, E flat, and then let's let's analyze that. If we move the A up to here, and then we move the E flat up to here, we have a zero one six. So it's a it's a different type of. 016, it has a very different sound from, um, well, we could switch it around and do that. Those are the same pitch classes. And then, so this is this exact um, 
same set class, same voicing and everything, just down a whole step. And this is the logic here, obviously. You take this 1016 and you transpose it down by a whole step. That's what's happening the whole time here. Same thing. Oops. And here we have it again. Okay, so basically different voicings of the 016 that are stated and then uh, transposed down a whole step. And then what's kind of cool at the very end of this movement, we have, let's blow this up a little bit. We have this um, A. Spanish, so I don't know what this means. Kano, you probably know what it is. <laughs> anyway, well, what is that? Well, you can see I've written it here. It's the, um, it's a very straightforward presentation of zero one four six. If we count from the top down, zero one four six, we've got the all interval tetrachord, uh, which is of course. Um, Zero one four six four Z twenty nine zero one four six the all interval tetrachord. Even though there are two all interval tetrachords, remember the four Z twenty nine and the the four Z fifteen Z because they're Z related, meaning they share the same um, interval class vector. Each of them has one instance of each. Uh, interval class, if we take the 0, 1, 4, 6, we've got, here's the 1, here's the 2, here's the 3, here's the 4, and here's the 5, and if we take the 4, Z, 29, 0, 1, 3, 7, we've got, here's the 1, here's the 3, here's the 4, uh, here's the 5, uh, obviously that's a 7, but if we in Invert it. That's the seven, and there's the six. Anyway, um, let's see. What are we doing here? Okay, let's continue. Um, well, that's basically it. Is um, we end with this beloved chord of Crum and Carter. You know the. This all interval tetrachord, except uh, in this case, it's it's inverted. Instead of zero one four six, it's zero one four six, and uh, you know preceded by all these zero one sixes. So you notice the zero one six is a subset of the zero one four six. We haven't talked about subsets, but zero one six zero one six. Of course, that's the inverted version. We add this note, and then we've got our all-interval tetrachord. Okay.